Good morning, everybody, and welcome to PSG of Mercer County. The Professional Service Group of Mercer County is a group that is here for you, anybody that is in any kind of career transition. And our mission is to help you be more efficient and more effective, help you be more efficient and more effective in your job search. And of course, happy Aloha Friday, because it's chilly and snowing, I decided to wear my black Hawaiian shirt today, my black uh, with the nice flowers on it. So that's what I wore. And I'm even wearing a long sleeve tee underneath it. So make sure that I'm nice and warm on this chilly day. <laughs> In addition to being Aloha Friday, today is National Blueberry Pancake Day. So if you have not had breakfast yet, or if you're going to go out to the store for your uh, snowbound weekend, uh, in addition to getting uh, milk and eggs, maybe you get some blueberries and pancake mix and you can celebrate National Blueberry Pancake Day. Always fun to have a blueberry pancake if you enjoy those. Uh, our professional service group of Mercer County has resources to help you become and be more efficient in your job search. One is we do have our LinkedIn group. If you are new to our uh, group here in person, I encourage you and invite you to join our LinkedIn group. We have uh, almost 1,700 members, I think 1,697 or eight. Uh, it's a very large, sizable group, but they are all people that have been through our program, have been in attendance at least once. So these are not just name collectors and list collectors. As a matter of fact, we do not uh, accept anyone into our LinkedIn group who has not been to one of our in-person or virtual meetings. We just want them to uh, you know, be part of the mission of the, the group here. And once you're in the group, uh, share some articles or job leads or posts. Um, or comments when you see someone, if they wrote something of interest to you, because LinkedIn does like when their members are active, it does help bring you up a little bit higher in their search algorithm. So uh, please join our LinkedIn group uh, when you can. And we do check about once a week or so to make sure uh, people that have uh, uh, requested to join, we get them in in time before the next week. We do also have our uh, website. It is psgofmercercounty.org psgofmercercounty.org. And uh, we do have over 120 pages, web pages of content. It's a very robust uh, website. Um, I will not call it wordy. Hammond and I had this discussion yesterday. It is robust. And uh, but a lot of information and helpful information and guidance for anyone in career transition, not just those of us in New Jersey. Um, you may want to take a look at our open jobs page. Our open jobs page, it does have a place where people can post jobs. Uh, lately, that hasn't been as active, not really sure why, but that's okay. But we also have links, seven links on that page to our job boards pages. And those are seven counties, Mercer County and the seven border counties. And in each of those seven county pages are links to uh, t up to 26, actually over 2,600 different companies in those seven counties, their career pages. So you can use our career page link, our uh, posting page there, at the very least, if you're looking to be hired in central New Jersey, you can create a targeted company list just from seeing the companies that may be hiring in the area. And you can also click on their link to get to their company page. So it's exactly what they are posting currently, not just what they're telling other people. So take a look at the page. Hopefully that will be helpful to you as a, as a good resource. Um, once again, our ground rules are that uh, I'm turning over or just turned over the meeting to Hannon. I'll introduce him in just a moment. And uh, then he will uh, go into his presentation and share his screen. Uh, but do ask you to use chat for questions and answers. Chat in the upper right corner is a little kind of circular tab. I thought I had a picture of it here with a little circular icon with a little tab on it. Kind of looks like this. So this is my um, uh, little cards here. And uh, you click on that and you can type a message on the bottom. You have a choice of who to send it to. Don't just send the question to me or to Hannon. Send it to everybody so that Hannon, myself, Shelby, we all have a chance to look at it. I'm going to be um, uh, vetting the questions. And so type the word question followed by your question. Or if you prefer, if you think you just have a long 
question to type, just type the word question and that'll be the digital equivalent of raising your hand. And so we will be able to recognize you. And so uh, as I see uh, a, a logical point to take a break, maybe if Hannon moves on to his next bullet or slide or just gasps for air, I will say, excuse me, uh, there is a question and uh, he will stop and we will address the question at that time. But when you are not uh, actually speaking to us, please keep your microphones on mute again, just as a courtesy to make sure that uh, you do not have any uh, accidental background noise that comes through. So good, I think we are all set and ready to go and I'll be happy to say I am just very pleased to welcome our speaker this morning, Hannon M. Isaacs Esquire. Uh, I found a lot of lawyers have the last name of Esquire. It must be a family practice. Hannon M. Isaacs Esquire. Hannon is a mediator, arbitrator, and trial lawyer in the employment law field. As an advocate, he works principally for <clears throat> employees. Hannon's primary legal services are negotiation and dispute resolution, emphasizing advocacy for employees in federal, state, and local government employment, and the private and sector matters as well, including profit, for-profit and nonprofit. In addition, Hannon is a frequent lecturer, blog and article writer, and multimedia presenter. Hannon received his JD, Juris Doctorate, from the University of North Carolina School of Law with honors in 1979, and an MA in American Legal History from Rutgers University, also in 1979, and a BA from Rutgers College with honors in 1975. PSG of Mercer County is very honored to welcome Hannon Isaacs. Thank you, David. Can you hear me okay? I do hear you perfectly fine. Very good. Welcome everyone, good morning. And I wanna say the last time I presented to this group was about 33 months ago, long before anybody knew what the word COVID meant. I'm really glad to be back doing an update on the law as it relates to employment. And um, before I do that, I want to say there was a lot of chatter on LinkedIn. Um, I think I provoked a good amount of it, but people were writing back and forth. And uh, I got this comment by one of the commenters who I think is actually here today. Uh, this is what it said, quote, Hannon's not boring. I took that as a compliment. Uh, I'm not going to give away this person. It was uh, Errol K. A column A. And, um, and I don't want to be boring. In fact, Dave will remind you at the drop of a hat, the last time I was here, I called it disrobing. He calls it a striptease. I'm not doing that today. I have completely new material. I'm going to exercise a presenter's privilege and present just a couple of minutes to get our brains going well this morning. Shelby, hit it. Dave. Open the pod bay doors, Al. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Al. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. Frank! And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Scene. All right, well, what we have there is Frank and Dave in another lifetime. Frank Kovacs, Dave Shuckman, with George Pace doing artificial intelligence and Alex Freund in the role of Captain Kirk. So I have a name for them. It's called Geo Freivex. Yes, in this time of conspiratorial thinking, I just think that's funny. Okay, 
So good morning, everyone. And I just want to say, I think it's important to say that no tape dispenser or stapler was hurt in that enactment. Very important. So um, what I'm doing here is taking, we did probably 28 slides three years ago. It was a lot. And I gave them mostly equal opportunity as you would if you did discrimination law cases. But this year I'm focusing on a couple of totally new ones that didn't even have to be discussed then. And some of the prior ones that I can give more emphasis to and some updates on those. So what's my first slide? This is not gonna surprise you. Look, vaccines. Um, there's a lot of material here. I'm gonna say uh, Dave has graciously requested and I said, sure, you will all have access to these slides after the program. I'm sure he'll say that again at the end. So this has been a mess, the vaccine mandates. Um, personally, I think they're amazingly smart. What is the number one goal of any employer in the United States, government, private sector, profit, not for profit, Number one goal, protect your employees. They should be able to leave at the end of the day, no worse off physically, mentally, emotionally than they were when they got there, and they should have more shekels coming into their pockets. So the idea of, a private, of, a, of an employer mandating that people as a condition of new employment, existing employment, or future employment, must be vaccinated by whatever definition the employer figures that they want to do. It could be one dose, two doses, two doses and a booster. If you're in Israel, two doses and two boosters, whatever it is, you get to decide as the employer what degree of protection you want to give to your employees. Now, there may be people on this um, meeting this morning who don't like mandates, they don't like the vaccine, they think that for every one person who takes a shot, three die. I welcome your belief, that's fine. I'm not gonna get, get into a debate about that, even though I don't agree with that, but I wanna talk about the mandate. So basically what happened is that the federal government through the Biden administration's decrees said, at some point, I think it was October, that starting in January, a, the entire federal workforce had to be vaccinated as a condition of employment, or you had to be tested, I think it was twice a week, right? So they gave that option. Wow, what a, a burden that would be. But if people said, no, I'm not doing it, I have a religious reason, I have a physical reason, they're, they're gonna have to take testing. But more than that, the Biden administration said, if you're a private sector employer, nonprofit, for-profit, doesn't matter, um, you must, if you have more than 100 employees, you have, we're mandating that you mandate this testing and uh, vaccination requirement. Um, and I'm not sure what the mechanism was to enforce it or uh, punish companies that didn't do it because we didn't really have to find out because the federal courts went into overdrive. And by January of this year, January 13 to 22, the Supreme Court blocked most of the mandate. The only thing they permitted is a modest requirement that vaccination could be required for healthcare workers in facilities receiving federal funding. That's a big band, but it's fairly narrow. Um, now, companies can do what they want. And like I say, fully vaccinated could mean different things to different people. I will say this, if anybody said to my office, we're having an employment issue because we have a religious um, reason not to get a vaccination and we wanna come talk to you about it, I say, if you're not vaccinated, I'll talk to you on Zoom. But my staff and their families are not willing to put themselves at risk so I have a mandate, You have not even a mask, you gotta have a vaccination. Now, I don't go this far. Some people actually, like in New York, if you've gone to restaurants in the last few months, 
you have to show them your vaccine card or put it together, put it up on um, your phone, you know, showing the database. I'm, I'm, I'm on the honor system with that. If somebody really wanted to be bad to me, they would come in fully COVID ridden and breathe. I wouldn't know it, you know, unless I got sick. Now, I also put at the bottom a note. Look at the date. January 19, six days after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled, not coincidentally, Governor Murphy, knowing what the Supreme Court had done, signed an executive order requiring vaccines for workers in healthcare congregate settings. We're not talking about synagogues here. This would be more like uh, uh, in the, uh, assisted living, nursing homes, as well as requiring boosters. So why did he do that? Because he knew no challenge was going to succeed, either in the state court or in federal court, to that. So he could have tried to make it broader. Maybe he will and say 100 employees or more, you have to do this or that. But that has not happened so far. Okay, next. This is an incredibly important issue. Uh, it's always been an important issue, and it shifts from time to time. I've added some things from the one that we did three years ago. So interviewers, whether they're people or Alex Freund will tell you a robot, whatever it is, we require answers to the following questions. Tell us how many children you're planning to have. Illegal. Tell us about your religious beliefs. We are a religious um, business. And we want to make sure that all our people have similar beliefs. Illegal. How about if you're a Catholic church looking for a bookkeeper? Do you have the right to say to somebody, if you're not Catholic, we're not hiring you? The answer is yes. Because of First Amendment issues, that exception has been uh, held constitutional up to the U.S. Supreme Court. There was a case probably two years ago now, about an adoption agency that was connected with Catholic charities saying, we're sorry if you're a mixed religious marriage or you're not going to agree to raise the child with Catholic beliefs, we're not interested in um, having a child go to you from our agency and we'll help you go elsewhere, but we're not required to do that. And they were getting some federal funding. That case, the U.S. Supreme Court, which is more on the religious end of things these days than it had been for a long time before, said that was okay. Your prospective employer should not be asking you questions or their HR people or a recruiter on their behalf about marital status, about sexual or gender identity. Um, those are illegal questions. You know, I'm not talking about chit chat. If you bring it up, they're allowed to talk about it. But if you do what I think you should do and just ask the, answer the substantive issues or ask the substantive questions, you'll be fine. Uh, criminal record. This is fascinating. I love stuff like this. There's a doctrine called ban the box. What's the box? It's the check off box. And the screen is going to light up here on chat with, hey, they put that right on the internet. What about this? Have you ever been arrested or convicted of a matter greater than a parking ticket? What do we do about that? It's an illegal question. The only thing New Jersey, Philadelphia, and some other jurisdictions permit is in the last round of interviews, they're allowed to do a background check. They're allowed to bounce you. What's the theory of that? That sounds like uh, procedure over substance. The theory is, let them fall in love with you. First round, second round, third round. And then they come to find out, oh, sadly, you murdered somebody when you were 15. No, I think that's still gonna be a problem. Um, but, you know, something happened way in the recesses of time. <coughs> that, that's the box is not is totally banned. It's just banned at the beginning. But what's this other crazy thing, past the trash? Uh, does your box go in the trash? No, this has to do, New Jersey had a number of notorious cases 
I want to I want to say a lot of legislation is based on notorious cases. So you have Megan's law. You don't want to know what happened to Megan. And similar case statutes are named after people. Pass the trash has to do with a teacher, a janitor, a principal, a superintendent who totally screwed up in jurisdiction one. In New Jersey, they were in a school district. They were caught sexually harassing or molesting somebody and they offer a quick resignation and then they go over to district two. That happened in this state for decades. Sounds kind of like the Catholic church. This priest is terrible for this diocese, but let's put him over at that one. Pass the trash means don't go from district one to district two. As a matter of fact, district two is required to check on district one and find out why did this person leave? Exactly why. They resigned. Why did they resign? Tell us more. And these are all for liability reasons. Suing um, a teacher, suing the, the um, school system, the, the Board of Education. Even though it's a public entity, there are exceptions to what's called sovereign immunity. The king can do no wrong. Yes, the king can. If it's bad enough, they're going to get through that. Interesting one, salary history. That's new since 33 months ago. New Jersey has banned the right of an employer to ask you in writing, on the internet, in person, through a recruiter, what you're earning in your present job, in your last job. Now, why is that? Because they don't want to have, the legislature doesn't want to have a rush to the bottom. So the job on the market is really worth 125,000, but you can find somebody who's willing to take it for 65,000. Legislature saying bad public policy. So you can tell people, here's the range of the, the salary we're offering. The employee can volunteer the information if they're okay with it but it's not something that can be directly asked. This is an interesting one. Look at the gentleman in the picture. Okay, what do we notice? Uh, if it was me as the employer, I'd say, didn't pull his tie all the way up to his button. Maybe doesn't do a great job on detail. But how about the hair? How about the mustache and the slight beard? If that employer says, essentially, you're not going to fit in here, or they don't say it, but in fact, they happen to know they were the best qualified based on a knowledge of some other candidates. There may be an implied racial stereotype. How about a tattoo? The employer says, I'm very conservative. Our uh, guests, our customers, they're just not in the tattoo field. I guess I would ask, what does the tattoo look like? What does it say? If it's a tattoo of Martin Luther King versus a butterfly versus um, a skull and crossbones or a tattoo that covers over the person's entire face, we'd have to have a discussion about that. How do you handle unlawful questions? We're gonna get disagreement right here on our group. Some people say, there's nothing you can do. Just suck it up. Answer the bad question. Uh, do your best to mitigate the bad question. You go in there and you've got a HR interviewer who says, "Now this is uh, not a this is not an, a formal religious organization, but we're very conservative. We don't like people taking off for pregnancy. We don't like Muslims." We don't like people living together in sin, and we must know your salary, and we need to know if you're trans, and we don't like your hairstyle because it reminds us of, you know, bad things. Okay, so there are various ways to handle the ending of that interview. I suggest you thank them and leave. That's me. If you're totally desperate for a job, I'm going to say you take that job, you're going to be totally desperate to leave that job for the most part. I don't think there's any great way to say to people, you know those are unlawful questions, don't you? 
Or how about this one? On the advice of legal counsel, I'm not answering that. That's a good one. Uh, that could also probably be your exit line. So we can talk more about that. I'm sure there's some things to talk about. Next one. This is, this has been in existence for going on four years. I want to remind people we have a paid sick leave act in New Jersey. Believe it or not, even if your employer has never told you this, and I like to say about this presentation, this is the handbook. I'm telling you the handbook. If you read something in a handbook that's inconsistent with this, it's probably because it's out of date or the employer doesn't want you to know what the law is. Or maybe they're just ignorant. But you get an hour of paid sick leave for every 30 hours you work. Shelby, did you know that? Now I do. She's saying now she does. I think it's in the handbook. She's telling me she didn't read it. Anyway. Um, one hour paid sick leave for every 30 hours work, up to 40 hours, which could be for most employers a week, might be five, you know, a, a sixth day, depending. And uh, this maxes out at 1,200 hours. Uh, you're allowed to carry over your unused time. So if you accumulate 40 hours in 2021 and you get really sick in 2022, even if you haven't worked 1,200 hours or 1,000 or maybe 90, you're entitled to take the time. But you cannot get more time than that 40 hours in that new year. So if you carry over 40, you have 40. That's how that works. Now, employers like me, we do way better than that, right? We have, depending on where you are, you come in with probably three weeks and after X number of years, you get another week. Uh, plus, in my view, people want to, and that's for paid time off, sick leave, vacation. You want to take off Martin Luther King's day, my office doesn't close, but you're allowed to be out. Nobody asks, nobody tells. It's your complete business. If you need more time than that, as a small employer, I'm not mandated under federal or state law to grant you 12 weeks, but I'll do it with the understanding you're not getting paid if I really want you back. Why do they make the distinction for small business? Because a small business might not be able to hold that position for a full 12 weeks. If you get the 12 weeks, trust me when I tell you, if you stay out 12 weeks in a day, you can be fired. Oh, excuse me, Hammond. Yes. So there are a couple of questions uh, actually related to the prior slide. I'll just read it out loud. So Lucius's question, when filling out online applications, many companies are optionally asking if you have a disability and for your ethnic background. Is this info collected by the company or provided to a third party for statistical purposes? So, of course, I cannot say because I don't know who's collecting for what purpose and who they're giving it to. My standard operating recommendation and advice to people is if it's an unlawful question, do not answer it, right? Here's one. Have you ever been arrested for something greater than a parking ticket? That's a doubly unlawful question because who cares what you were arrested for? Depends on what actually happened. So number two, since they can't ask you until the last interview round, why are you knocking yourself out of the first round? And if they then say to you, I'm sorry, David, you didn't answer that question. We can't put your um, application in until you do. You're gonna have to make a judgment call. <clears throat> you could say, it is my clear understanding that that's really not a question you're allowed to ask. I can give you reasons for that, but I don't, I'm constitutionally not willing to answer things that shouldn't be asked. And it's not saying that you did anything. You know, maybe you didn't. Racial stuff, you know, the employer has certain obligations under EEO, but I don't believe the recruiter probably has any type of mandate like that. Maybe there's a recruiter <laughs> online with us who can share that. I kind of doubt it. Maybe the employer would say, we're looking to diversify. So, you know, this is important. But trust me when I tell you, I have litigated what are, used to be called reverse discrimination cases. I represented a white guy who was passed over for eight jobs for which he was best qualified 
in the federal sector because that agency said, we want this agency to look like America. So I don't care if you're the best qualified, we need somebody else in here, right? Uh, that agency eventually changed their rules for 50,000 employees because it was wrong. Now, within, I don't know, six, eight, 10 months, the US Supreme Court may be overruling affirmative action until there's more liberal justices on the court. If it stays six to three, that might be out the door altogether. And there may be no data collection at that point. So that remains to be seen. But I would not answer anything. If you have a question about whether it's okay or not, write me, call me. I will give you that information. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, there's another question, Hannon. This is from Sam. Does the salary inquiry ban apply to businesses in New Jersey or candidates in New Jersey? What if the company has offices in New Jersey and the interview is through an office in another state? And the presumption is the job is gonna be in another state. Yes, so the rule about that is, is where do you report? Even if you're in New Jersey, if you are a New York employee, because the headquarters are there and you're e either COVID nesting here or they just have, you're their home office, you, re you have to know what the law is of that other jurisdiction. <clears throat> the mere fact that that question would be unlawful if asked of a candidate for a New Jersey position uh, is not the operable, operative question. Okay. So, counts where where you're officially working so here's another example where do i file for my unemployment claim the job answers to new york but i'm in new jersey and i was terminated you have a new york application that's the law of new jersey the law of pretty much every state and um following up also in the prior slide um when do you seek uh, legal, when, when do you seek ju legal justice once the interviewer has asked you that illegal question? So this is really a key question. First of all, if I'm you, I'm gonna wanna know that it was improper. Just off of that, was it improper? Because I gotta clear it in my brain. Right? I gotta know, is there anything to talk about beyond that? So let's say we get to it. Yes, it's improper. They shouldn't have done it. Then the question is, what do you want to do about it? Let me tell you the worst idea. Uh, I would say, unless you're older than 62, the worst idea as a 20, 30, 40, 50 year old is to say, have a lawyer write them and say, uh, we're going to file a claim against you uh, unless you pay X dollars or do or cease and desist type of thing because you're gonna bog yourself down. You could write to that person and say, I checked this out, I just want you to know, for your benefit and the benefit of anybody else you interview, that's a question you should not be asking, just for your information, but no threat, no nothing like that, right? Now, why do I say 62? Because if this is in the area of like, the last job you're gonna get, and you really feel like, you want to make the point, like kind of a civil rights type of thing, which it is, you can make the legal claim, you can file the claim. You know, you barred me from uh, my prospective employment, I was highly qualified, and you knocked me out on that basis. I don't think I would recommend it. I think you'd have to be um, independently wealthy to do it. You'd really want to make the point. I think you could do it, like here's an example. I don't do these cases anymore, I refer them, but I used to do medical malpractice cases for plaintiffs, for the patients, really, really hard cases. But people would call me up and say, I had um, a dental problem and it was very painful and they had to redo the work in the other office. How do you feel today? I'm perfect, look at this smile. Well, how, how much did it put you out, you know, financially, uh, uh, pain and suffering? You know, it was tough at the time, but it's not lingering. My response was, write to the board of dentistry. Tell them this is a complete screw up that this person did. And the other dentist you went to that fixed it said, oh my God, I've never seen anything so bad. So you deal with issues like licensure, which is really big. 
quite frankly, I'd almost rather have somebody sue me for malpractice on a frivolous case than go file an ethics complaint and prosecute that for two years. That could really hurt me. So that's another avenue of redress. Okay, there are just a couple more. Let's see if we can get to them quickly so we can move on. And I know folks, you have a lot of questions. I think what we also wanna consider is um, they may be answered in upcoming slides and Hannon, feel free to let us know that. Uh, Nancy's asking, what is the maximum number of employee companies, employees a company can have to be considered a small company? So that goes to your earlier comment. So Nancy, different statutes, federal and state have different thresholds. So the one about paid sick leave, I'm quite sure it applies to somebody who's got one other employee other than themselves. That's just a mandate. There are others that have 15. There are others that have 50, five zero. Uh, I said the federal mandate was 100 in terms of mandating the vaccine. So you have to look at the particular, um, it's not whether they're small business or not small business, it's whether, you know, what particular public policy is being pushed forward and what is the burden on that business of a certain size. Okay, um, Edith is asking, it's not specific enough, does New York State have the similar statutes? So I guess at least from what you talked about so far, or maybe in general, does New York State have similar statutes, I guess, in employment? New Jersey, I did this when we did this a few years ago, I asked people, raise your hand, do you think New Jersey is the best, the worst in between? Most people are surprised to know New Jersey is one of the top jurisdictions from the point of view of an employee. And you'll hear this often from Republican uh, governor candidates who go, the businesses are going to Pennsylvania. Yeah, because they don't care as much about their employees as New Jersey does. That's just, we've considered our cost of doing business. Same thing with education, right? So um, this is a state that cares a lot. However, still understand we're an at-will jurisdiction there are unions, but there is a very small part of the uh, public sector and private environment. Probably an average 90% of employees are one to one with their company. You know, maybe I got a new case. There's three employees who had the same thing happen. Great. They probably have, you know, 100,000 employees in that company. So um, basically, uh, you, you have to look at it. A lawyer can help you. A lawyer can. Uh, explain these things to you. Um, the, the New York experience is different from New Jersey. They're sort of in between. New York City has certain laws that are specific. I just told you before, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia has a ban the box thing about criminal record. The rest of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania doesn't. So, you know, uh, I, I can't answer any more specifically than that at this moment. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna merge two questions together. One is from John, one is from Shai. Uh, I've seen uh, asked sexual orientation, gender, or whether transgender is labeled as voluntary. However, the system would not allow me to proceed without the information. And I'll add on Shai's question. If your application has been declined because of how you answered, can you prove the answers caused the, the qualification? That's a great question, and it goes across multiple themes and slides. Okay. Proof is tough. You can have the belief. You can have the feeling. I have a woman who gave birth at 38 weeks. Her manager, a woman, and she's a manager. Her super manager gave her a very hard time. There were a couple things in writing that I just felt like were wrong, wrongfully stated. And then she, it turns out while she was out, even though she was FMLA protected for her full 12 weeks, she came back and they shifted her to a different job. That has the indicia of a claim. I can't prove anything yet, but I've told her it's worth pursuing. If you've got a complete wall that says, I did this, it stopped me, I didn't answer, it kicked me out and I didn't get the job, do I have a claim? I'm gonna say, need more information. Now, how would you get that? You'd have to sue them. And not only that, 
it's going to be some deep searching because you're dealing with an outside company that's talking to the inside company and they're dealing with computer systems and we're going to have to get um, a computer analyst to go in and look at the interstices and intricacies of the system to figure that all out. Now, maybe somebody's out there doing a class action uh, on these types of things. You're not going to get the average employment lawyer to really touch that unless you say, and this is a big differentiator, I'll pay hourly. I'm not worried about a contingent fee. I'm a trust child and I can afford it. I'll pay up to a half a million dollars. I want you to call me after this program. In fact, raise your hand because we will be in touch. Okay, let's move on. This is always going to be an important topic and it's getting worse, my opinion, every year. Now, I'm going to say right now, there's an employee favorable um, economy. We hear this every day and every night, and I'm sure it's true, but it's not uniformly true. Depends on where you are in the hierarchy of, you know, uh, job qualifications, um, your background, your experience, a number of other factors as to whether you are highly competitive, moderately competitive, or uncompetitive. I think Alex and I have this conversation all the time. He's like, it's a mixed message, a mixed bag out there. So the first thing you have to do if you're working right now or if you're offered a, a, a position, take a close look at the offer letter, take a close look at any supplemental policy statements, handbook statements, signed agreements you're being asked to do. What are they asking me to do when I leave? Now, isn't that ironic? You haven't gone in the door and you're already like the great generals uh, planning your exit strategy. The answer is that's exactly what you have to do. And there are actually things that could be so onerous in these documents that you might wanna not go to that job, right? They can sideline you for six months, a year, two years, if they wanna really push it even more. They can say, this is a mom and pop operation that only cares about five miles. No, it cares about a county, a region, a state, a state of a region of states, half the country, the entire country. How about the world? Now, if it's a mom and pop store and they're stopping you for two and a half years for the world, that will never be upheld. You don't have to worry about that. But if you're working for IBM, or a similarly large company, you could, you have to believe that that could come back and get you. Now, I've seen some really interesting variations re recently. There is a locally famous company in the Princeton area. It's an international group. They put a non-compete in there that says it's international, it's 12 months, but if we ask you to honor it, we will pay you for 12 months. Do you know New Jersey was looking at a piece of legislation like that? Hey folks, if you want me to sit on the sidelines for six months, a year, 18 months, 24 months, then you damn well better pay me. Now, my first response when I heard that that bill had been put into the hopper was, we're gonna find out whether the companies themselves actually think that's important because they're probably not going to want to pay for it. That's expensive. You're paying somebody to not work. So it's a mixed bag as far as that goes. But I want you to understand if it's a reasonable geography and a reasonable term, you're, you have to believe that you may be held to it. Now, there are things we can do. I had a guy who did work for IBM. He had this non-compete clause. He was put out of work. He had his severance agreement. He was in the middle of it. He goes to a competitor who wants him, who looks at the agreement, which you have to show them, the recruiter and HR, whoever wants to see it in the new company. Do not lie. You fail to show them something that they need to see, you are out. That is serious as a heart attack. If you show it to them, what this guy said is they told him, you have to get rid of that. And he came to me and said, how do I do that? 
I said, do you have anybody in the company who loves you? Yes, I have one of my old managers who's still there, thinks I'm great, has great access to the people in charge. I said, go to him and ask him for help. They sent us a 15 page amendment to the severance agreement that said under these conditions, he could go. You can do that, that does work. If they refuse, then you go back to the other company and you say, please, and they say, no, you're on the sidelines and they're probably not gonna have to pay you. The other piece here is about confidentiality, about discrimination claims. I don't care if they put that in an old severance agreement, a new severance agreement, a handbook, it's no longer valid. They cannot silence you. This came out about the, uh, um, what's the guy's name? The, the, one, the one from Hollywood. Help me out, Dave. I don't know a lot of the people director, in Hollywood. The director guy. Harvey, Harvey Weinstein. Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein, yeah. Do you know there were probably 10 or 12 people who he had molested, who had these non-disclosure clauses of their settlements, and states started to make amendments to the law, including New Jersey. There's no more confidentiality about discrimination claims. And they also say the employer is allowed to, this is one of those um, weird, like ban the box things. Okay, note to employee, if you break the confidentiality, we're allowed to defend ourselves, right? So Harvey says to the actress, you start talking about me, I'm gonna show you the love letters. That's legal. That can be done. But generically speaking, you can't ban people from talking about or going to the press about discrimination claims in private sector cases. Ironically, the governor, I believe Governor Murphy, backtracked after the rape claim about one of his staffers and said, but when it comes to public employees, we want to maintain confidentiality. I thought that was hilarious. However, I'm not sure what, ha what ended up happening. That one's like laugh it out of the legislature. Okay. Good so Hannon, there's a yeah. question from Sam. Does a layoff or a firing nullify a non-compete clause or other covenant? Sam, that is an excellent question. The answer is it does not. Whether you opt out or they opt you out, that contractual provision, if legitimate and enforceable, will be enforced. Excellent question. I wish I'd have said it myself. Okay, this is a generic slide. New Jersey makes it unlawful for an employer to discriminate in hiring, promotion, demotion, firing. These are all the things you need to know. It's everything. I'm not even gonna say it into the record, but when you get the slide, review it. Um, that's the New Jersey law against discrimination. It's the equivalent of the federal Title VII protection, uh, which used to not include, the feds did not recognize sexual orientation or transgender as a complainable issue. So if you went into the federal sector, believe it or not, or a federal contractor, and you were cross-dressing or you're transgender with or without surgery, and they're like, sorry, we don't hire your kind. Up until two years ago, that was lawful. What happened two years ago? Justice Neil Gorsuch, a Trump employee, for I believe a five to four um, uh, justice count, said, oh, sexual orientation and transgender are not specifically mentioned in Title VII, but it all comes out of gender discrimination. I'm still reading that and trying to figure out where he got that. But the fact is it's now unlawful to discriminate in those areas under the federal statute as well. We also have discrimination against people with disabilities. This is an EEOC uh, jurisdictional thing, the ADA. Actually, no, it's not. It's the Department of Federal Department of Labor. You can put in your claims there, but New Jersey covers it. You don't have to go to federal court in a state like New Jersey to get your rights um, taken care of, honored, uh, because federal court is much more complicated, technical, expensive, clumsy, 
uh, most of us in employment law stick with state court cases, but those federal claims are out there. Um, Anti-retaliation. You have, for example, um, New Jersey's whistleblower law. Whistleblower can mean many things. In the federal sector, it could mean you're, you're um, Dave Shuckman, and you happen to notice that the feds are buying golden toilets when a good porcelain one is available and they're overspending by $32 million per year, Dave can be Joe Citizen or Dave Citizen and he can file a claim and if it gets approved, he can get a huge reward financially, millions as a whistleblower. New Jersey does not mean that. Our anti, uh, um, our anti-retaliation for whistleblowing is um, pollution from a company, unlawful acts of the company, uh, theft, collusion, you know, many different things that happen if you go to the press or threaten to, if you go to a regulatory agency or threaten to, if you go to a manager and tell them, and then you're out the door, you can file a whistleblower claim. The only thing you need to know is most discrimination claims in New Jersey have to be filed in two years from the date of the adverse action. And with the cases of pay parity, the, they've made an exception that you can actually go backwards for a certain period of time. They used to say you can't, but whistleblowing is only one year. So if you've been the victim of whistleblowing retaliation by demotion or firing, you have to file within a year. Okay, that's how that slide was a lot of words that I said, not so much on it. This oh, is excuse my me, Hannon. Slide. Excuse yeah. me, Hannon. There is a question from John. It's actually the prior slide of non compete. In the absence of a non compete, how long after leaving a position can you be able to discuss some information that you were privy to by nature of your role that could be traced to your former employer? So this is a great question. So a lot of times these clauses that show up in offer letters or policies or written contracts, there are three parts. One, don't steal our employees for X months or years. Two, don't steal our customers or refer them to other people or companies. And three, don't breach confidentiality. And here's how they define confidentiality, almost universally. If it's something that the marketplace knows, it's not confidential. So I, these stupid agreements, they say things like, if you learn something on this job about how we do our unique pricing and everybody in the industry does it the same way, you can blab the first minute you leave. If it's something that's unique or it could even be covered by intellectual property rights, a patent, a trademark, then you reveal that or use that at your peril. If you have a question, happy to answer it outside of this group. If it's a patent trademark piece, I will bring in somebody who specializes to help you differentiate that. That's a super specialty that I just will not be able to do for you. Okay, one of my favorites, a performance improvement plan. Look who's driving, the angel of death. My paralegal, Kristen, came up with this for me because they said, there's got to be a great symbol. These plans are death on wheels. As soon as management tells you you're on it, it's time to start looking for a new job. Don't wait three seconds. I have heard a couple people tell me they survived them. Don't bet on it. That's who's coming for you. Don't bet on it. Oh, excuse me, Hannon? Yes. So Shai has a question. I found a, confidentially, a confidentiality clause in the employee handbook, but the employee handbook is not mentioned in my offer letter. Am I bound by the confidentiality clause? I'm going to say a qualified strong yes. The qualification is I'd want to see what the provision actually says. If it's obnoxious and overbearing, maybe it isn't even enforceable, and that does happen. If it's a plain vanilla, 
uh, you're to hold on to confidences that have these and those requirements and features. Assume for purposes of your employment that you are bound. By the way, these New Jersey doesn't love any of this, and it has cut back recently in the ways that I've described so far. And non compete clauses, non, uh, what would we call them? Non poaching clauses about employees or customers are by definition anti competitive. The Federal Trade Commission doesn't want anti competition because ultimately it's the consumers who profit. However, the way New Jersey does this, it says if these provisions are properly written and reasonably limited for a fair reason, like for example, I paid your salary for 10 years, Alex. Why are you going and taking the employees who you were supposed to not touch and putting them over to the next place? And you're sharing our trade secrets. If it strikes you as not fair, you shouldn't be doing it. If you put yourself in the employer's shoes and you wouldn't like that this was done, then you shouldn't be doing it. It's not like every man and woman for themselves. That's not the nature of the environment. And by the way, I'm gonna tell you something that will shock you. There is an implied um, uh, provision of fiduciary duty. It's a fancy word. Stop laughing at if you think it has the word douche in it. It's not spelled that way. Fiduciary. It means you owe a duty of loyalty. You cannot bite the hand that fed you unless the hand that fed you is very generous and says, go forth, do good things. How about this? In my field, my field, if I write a provision in the handbook, that says to my partner, Misty, who's not an equity partner, you cannot take uh, staff, you cannot take um, cases, and you, you have to keep my uh, proprietary clauses confidential for two years. The New Jersey Supreme Court, which regulates the practice of law, has banned uh, that type of provision in a law firm. Lawyers can leave and take clients willy-nilly. And if I tried to stop them, I would be sanctioned ethically. I'm not allowed to. Doctors can do that. And I see those clauses sometimes. So, but it's not competitive. And if what we're trying to do is help the, the public make a choice of a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, a, a, a information systems technologist, then those provisions should be held to the narrowest reasonable terms. That's why they're there and how they work. Anand, can you yes. please talk more about what discharge status means? That's a question from Sam. All right. So to be discharged or terminated or fired all means the same thing. Because it says discharge, that's not separated from your job. Yes, all of those are separations. But when you sign a separation agreement or a severance agreement, they never say you were fired. They said you and the company agreed voluntarily. It could also be that you resigned. And in exchange for your resignation, this is the way they're doing it. Now, they could have said to you, if you don't resign, we're discharging you. And that happens. So you'd probably rather have it say resignation or um, you know, mutual decision. But here's another thing. If you resign, you cannot get your unemployment benefits. So I tell our clients, hey, don't be so nice to them or bad to yourself. If they want to fire you, go do it. You're going to collect 26 weeks of unemployment. That could be very valuable to you. Sometimes you can negotiate, <coughs> I'm resigning, <coughs> you're discharging me, but I can still get my unemployment benefits. We can do that. We can ask that that be done. <clears throat> so this says here, discharge status is important. Can you collect or not? That's what I just said. If you can't wait another second, get fired. Better than quitting. Um, an employment quit is zero unemployment benefits. Don't forget. By, <laughs> yeah, by the way, there's a comment from Christine Dykman 
Uh, she's from the um, uh, Monmouth County Workforce Development Office. She wrote, not necessarily true, Hannon. Sorry. Uh, the answer is it depends. So, Christine. No, no. But that's the problem, David. She was okay. answering the first question I answered. Okay. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I have no idea what she's talking about. Christine, if you want to quickly just unmute and clarify your specific comment. Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have learned, even though I don't handle unemployment in New Jersey, that you can file, be denied, um, and file again. And nine times out of 10, you'll be approved, even if you were not terminated. So um, it's a matter of you fighting and reapplying as opposed to just saying, oh, well, I can't make it. Um, right. Very enlightening. I have an important comment here. Be yes. really, really careful about that advice. I also I'm not a lawyer, but I'm saying don't give up. Well, sometimes you have to give up. And let me give you a great example. This does happen. People get fired. And we had this three years ago. I stood in that group, wonderful people. And I said, who here thinks that if you take a golf club and smash it over your employer's head, you can still collect unemployment? And nobody raised their hand. Three questions later, a guy raised his hand. I want to go back to the golf club. I think you can get it. I'm like, I am so glad you said that here, not out there. No, you can't. That's a criminal act and you're not getting it. So if that person taking Christine's advice said, oh, I was denied, I'm going to refile for it and they refile and they get it. That's not the end of the story because the employer now gets notified. We do when our people leave sometimes. Hey, they left. Why did they leave? Because they hit me over the head with a golf club. That employee, former employee, who now has collected $5,000 is going to be asked to pay it back. And that is a real problem. Do not let that happen to you. But seriously. And absolutely. I agree with that, Hannon. I also know that if your policy says you have to be um, on time and you're late four times or you're drinking on the job, that you can still collect unemployment. So yes, there is a fine line between taking a golf club and smashing it over somebody's head and breaking a policy or rule, getting fired and still being able to collect unemployment. All right, so, so it really say, does I think, depend. I don't, I don't think it's a fine line, Christine. I think a golf club is clearly distinguishable from showing up late. However, you also put in drinking on the job. That one, you're going to get you're going to get dinged if it's a policy of the employer and you violate it willfully and you know persistently, you're probably going to lose a month or six weeks of unemployment. I'm saying we can't resolve this. Generally yeah. speaking, if you quit, do not file because you're cheating and they will find you and probably make you pay back. If you've done something that you think is really bad and they think is really bad, you're probably wasting your time and you might have to pay it back. If you might have to pay it back, yes. So it, it absolutely, I agree with that point as well, Hannon. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on now. I'm sorry, there's a question on, on the performance improvement plans from Michael. Regarding performance improvement plans, if you received a, a performance improvement plan that you feel was unfair or unjust, can you challenge to get it off your record? What if you fear retaliation from your manager? This is why I do these programs, Dave. That is a fabulous question. <laughs> so first of all, that begs a question. Do you have the right to access your own personnel file to even know what's in there? Every state looks at that differently. New Jersey permits it. I don't remember exactly what they do. It's something like once a year, and you can look at certain things, but not other things. And I'm not talking about public sector. This is private sector. Because uh, you want to know what's in there and is possibly influencing management's decision. If it's public sector, then you probably have a Public Records Act um, right to it. And maybe some folks on this call, even some of you know what those specifics are. But I'm going to say the, the, the sort of the most obvious one is you get a performance review. 
and it's terrible. And you've had, you know, 10 annuals in a row that are glowing off the charts and you have a new manager who has a beef with you or a tortilla chip, however we want to talk about that. And um, what can you do? Well, you can always rebut that. Sometimes there's a place where you can do that on the form. Other times you just write a carefully written, not aggressive, no editorial comment type thing to say, I do not believe that that assessment on, on factor four was reasonable or fair for the following reasons. Yes, sales are down, but it was in the middle of COVID. In fact, compared to our competitors, we were three times better than anyone. You know, yes, that's reasonable to do. You can also use HR. Say to them, I don't know what's going on here. Look at what's going on and show them. You know, if you've got somebody who's decent in HR, not who's just kind of an apologist and won't do anything. Um, sometimes if it's gross enough and grotesque, you're being retaliated against, you complained about the employer. How about this? You gave uh, information to a, um, a law firm that was, that was doing an investigation of a sexual harassment claim. And you went and truthfully said, yeah, I saw that, that happened. And the next thing you know, you're getting bad reviews. Okay, now you're talking to me because I'm gonna be saying that's retaliatory. We can go back to their counsel, HR, and start pushing back in that way. That does happen. You'd be amazed, I'm amazed. There are some very, very like top tier employers in New Jersey, let's say sometimes in the pharma field, sometimes like invented vaccines for uh, COVID, who have a manager who's so horrible that seven people at a high level complained and six of them quit and there's one left. And the company is letting that person stay there. It's like having the bad dog who will bite and has bitten six times. And the owner says, oh, Fifi has never done that before. You go, yeah, Fifi's a serial biter. You know, so you, you got to do your best. But I'm also going to say with the PIP and the bad review and whatever, the writing is on the wall. Don't hesitate. Unless you're in your 60s and this is your last job and you're gonna fight for it till the end, you better start looking around and see what the marketplace has to say to you. Dave, how much well, more time do we, how much time? Well, we've, we got, we've got plenty of time. It's only about a 10 after quarter after 11. Um, there's a, a question that follows up your, your Fifi comment. <laughs> um, this is from Anne. Are there any laws about employees who are bullies, racists, or sexist, employees, I guess employers uh, like this, are, employees like this are protected by employers and the target employees are pushed out. So are there any laws that protect the employees? So now this is where I get in trouble, seriously, right? Marty Latman calls me like so negative. Dave Shockman says, why are you so pessimistic? But I can't help it. I'm just gonna say, it's in my nature. I agree with Ann. Employers don't bring in, let's put it this way. I think Marty and Dave will agree with this. Do you know how hockey is played today and has been for the last 15 years on the pro teams? They have people who look like five-year-olds on a skating rink. They can barely stand up. But what do they have that you and I don't? They're 400 pounds and they can crush the other players in the corner. There's a word for them. Dave, what's it called? Uh, is it bullies? I don't watch hockey. <laughs> it's called the enforcer. Oh, okay. They actually have a paid guy who goes around crushing people. Right? And so New Jersey has no statute against employment sector bullying. Can you believe that? There is one. It's for schools. And why is that? Remember I said early, a lot of things are named for the people who got destroyed. This one is the Rutgers kid who jumped off the George Washington Bridge when his roommate took a compromising video and sent it around the dorm. That's why we have an anti-bullying statute for schools. 
as a matter of civil rights. But we don't have that because nobody's been killed or killed anybody yet in the employment sector for that. So they've been, I think uh, Linda Greenstein had uh, introduced it. She's our Senator regionally, uh, but I don't think it got out of committee. Um, so uh, the and chat, one more question. Yeah. Um, can you speak to non-disparagement clauses? This is from John. Yes, yes, we see these all the time. Now, remember something important, people. If they're not paying you enough to walk away in silence, then walk away loudly. And I've had that. I had a woman who was working for a union and they were horrible to her. They were sexist. They were demeaning, they were belittling, and she couldn't get anywhere with HR. And I wrote to them and said, this is her experience. What are you gonna do about it? And they basically said, go pound sand. We're gonna send the enforcer. No, they didn't say that. So they were offering her two weeks of, of uh, severance. And she's like, for two weeks severance, I'm gonna do, say bad things about them from the top of the mountain. Right, but if they're offering you twenty thousand or thirty thousand or fifty thousand dollars to shut up, and you don't want to shut up, I'm going to tell you to shut up. That's a lot of dough. You're going to need that money to carry you into your employment search. And Alex is going to say, for every ten thousand dollars you want, you're going to be putting a month into your search, or maybe more. So we have to be careful. However, there is something you can do to mitigate that provision, which is make sure that while you're not allowed to disparage the company or the institution, the company or institution also pledges not to disparage you. We negotiate those into the deal. We also say the only person who's going to take the calls from prospective employers is X in HR. And X will say name, rank, and serial number, and nothing more. We can negotiate about that. So that we can do. You're not going to get rid of them unless you don't want the deal. All right, unemployment benefits. I'm not going to go through this in detail. You'll read it now. You'll read it when you get the slides. However, look at the last three. This is what Christine and I were talking about. If you have been guilty of severe or gross misconduct, you lose your benefits. No golf clubs on heads. Severe misconduct, willful, malicious, deliberate intent to injure the employer or the workplace. Mere negligence or inter, inter, inter advertence doesn't suffice. Okay. Um, minor misconduct. If the employer wants to fight with you about that, you should fight them about that. And we win those cases. We represent people in unemployment claims. It's not a lot of money. You're gonna lose a lot if you don't fight them. And usually by the time we get to a hearing, the employer just gives in. They're not that interested. There is a question uh, related to the unemployment benefits. This is from Holy Cow. Oh, I know who that is. Um, recent article in the Trenton Times stated that New Jersey may have overpaid pandemic unemployment benefits to gig workers who were deemed eligible and then later deemed ineligible. And now New Jersey says they may try to collect the overpayment. Can they do that? Yes. They can do that in the area of tax refunds, unemployment claims, workers' comp benefits. So check this out. I had a lady who was Social Security disabled, but at the same time was getting her um, workers' comp benefits to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars. She kept them knowing that she was eventually going to have to pay them back. Why? because she had no other source of income. So we knew that going into it. And when she got her final award under uh, worker, under um, uh, 
workers' comp. They just took 25,000 bucks out. Okay, so sometimes that can work out okay. But I wouldn't really count on it. I'm not saying to go ahead and pay back the gig worker benefits. Make them come after you. But if they show you the math and they show you the reasons why, give it up. Not worth the fight and uh, it'll just bog you down. Okay, severance agreements. We talked about this. They're contractual. They're not state imposed. A, an employer does not have to pay you one penny or one day's pay. It's completely optional. Unless there is a severance agreement that says how much you get for your uh, uh, leaving pay by a handbook or a policy. Some really big companies have a schedule. For X years, you get Y weeks. For Y years, you get Z weeks. Why do they do that? Because they don't like being, um, you know, one Z, two Z. Somebody comes in and goes, yeah, you're offering me 10 weeks, but Joe over there got 20, and he's got the same amount of time that I do. So if they're smart, they stick to their schedule, and that's what they do. That, that becomes the end of it. So... Uh, severance agreements are enforceable. If there is valid consideration, they will always recite you're getting benefits you otherwise not entitled to, usually the big dollar amount. They protect the employers against litigation, contract breach, even physical injury, except for workers' comp, which has to be excluded. So you can get your severance and go after them for comp if you want. They exclude, they, they include employment discrimination, retaliation, whistleblowing, and any other source of employee rights up and down the board. They can include non-compete, non-solicitation, confidentiality, <coughs> and non-disclosure agreements subject to, they can't say, you're not allowed to talk about your discriminatory um, victimhood, uh, as I described before. The final one is probably the most important one because that is the best picture you're gonna see of me uh, in a dog's age. And like the guy who didn't have his tie all the way up, I would push that up a little bit right there. But other than that, it's all true and correct. Dave, any last questions? Yes, so there's one from Anna. Can you request your last performance document from your former employer? Some employers, I guess this is um, at application time, some employers looking for a last performance document. So I'm gonna answer that by starting in a different location to the greatest maximum extent you can possibly always and ever do it. Even if you're only shown the damn thing for 10 minutes, get a copy of it. Use your phone, do whatever you gotta do. Why? Because the employer could say at the end of 25 years of stellar service, sorry, you're out for a policy violation. How about this? 62 year 62 year old guy the only job he ever worked was for a very large transportation company in new jersey he got he had 25 letters from the company the family owned company president thanking him and extolling his virtues for 25 years and they fired him for like going through a stop sign um that's not why they fired him. they fired him because his daughter had a terrible illness that was costing the self-insured company a million bucks a year for insurance. That's why they fired him. So how would we have shown that if we didn't have Mr. President's name on 25 years worth, worth of thank you? Get and keep your performance and reviews. That doesn't mean throw out and don't keep the bad ones. You need all of them because we have to sort it out. How did that happen? What happened there? You were down, then you were up, 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 up. You know, get them. Okay, so you're at the end and they don't give it to you because you didn't take it and copy it. You can ask, but I don't think you can mandate it unless you're a former public employee there. I think you probably can get that. I can't say for sure, but you probably can. And they might decide to, uh, what is the, the word? To make it antiseptic. Like we'll give you these parts, but we won't give you those parts. Or we'll redact the names of the managers. Fine, give me what I need, you know? Liberty Mutual, just give me what I need. 
Any other questions, David? Um, there are no other questions, um, although Holy Cow likes your necktie. <laughs> I know who I Holy I, Cow is. I think I still have that necktie. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've got one like it. I kind of like that that color and pattern. That's a that's a Joseph Bank original. And that's funny. That's what he wrote. Nice necktie, tied perfectly from Joseph A. Bank? Question mark. So. <laughs> Absolutely. The shirt also, and also the suit. Okay. The beard I got from my mother. I I, I don't need to find one. that out. Yeah. She didn't have one, but that's where I got. Um, yeah, actually, I got my mustache from uh, my grandmother's brother. It's <laughs> so, so on my mother's side, yeah. I think that was Groucho. Um, Jean has a question. Any overall observation on the new DEI landscape? Is that D as in David? David, yeah, D, E like Ellison, and it looks like I like inbound. Unless, unless it's... D E L. I got this. No, no, I got this. So, okay, so in Africa, they have something called dead elephant income. I have no idea what DEI means, my people. John, you want to um, unmute and quickly just clarify your question? Uh, is that diversity and equity oh, and inclusion? Got it. So, what? Now, say it again. Is any what updates on? Any overall observation on the new DEI landscape? Got it. So this is really interesting to me. Um, I said before, we're not allowed technically, legally. Like, let's say this, the, the, the six justices who were going to knock um, uh, affirmative action out of uh, colleges, professional schools, even employment. Their theory is we must be racially blind in those sectors. Because to put in a racial or a gender or a transgender or an, um, an orientation or an ethnic or religious diversity, that means that we're, that we're no longer looking at merits and we're looking more at the rainbow and we're looking at public values, and we're looking at what Joe Biden and many other people have said, we want this agency, this government, this, this uh, job sector to look like America, right? So many people, myself included, say that's a value. That's a plus. What's wrong with that? What I've seen on the other side of that is, well, I'll just give it to you this way. This really happened. The guy who was passed over eight times for jobs in the federal sector that he was better qualified for, best qualified for, and we could prove it, and we did prove it, right? When he went for job interviews and he was going to be a manager, they said to him, Mike, that was his name, if you have two people who are equally qualified and one of them is black, female, and gay, and the other's a white guy, who are you going to pick? They really wanted to know that because there was a push back in the late 80s, continuing into the 90s, that this is the way things should go. And do you know what Mike said? Here's what I would say. I would say I have more questions because one of these candidates is the best qualified. I love that. And he lost eight jobs for that. Affirmative action at its height was never supposed to substitute for quality. It was only in an institution or an agency that historically suffered from discrimination, provably, that wanted to make changes to give people that opportunity that had been lost to them but they were equally qualified. Then you could tip the scale. That's how it's supposed to work. But that's not how it works, my friends. What happens is they get somebody who's best qualified. Hey, I just had this trial in Philadelphia. An Indian guy who was a, uh, what was his name? 
a an Indian Buddhist against a Puerto Rican Hispanic Spanish speaking uh, less qualified person who got the job because the manager was exactly the same profile of the guy from Puerto Rico. Provably. This is to me not right. And you know why it's not right? Because we it was the Federal Aviation Administration. And I'm just asking everybody on this call, people, you're about to take the big bird. Who do you want in the control tower? Junior? with five years experience that nobody in the department would go to to answer a question because he didn't know and he was going to everybody else or somebody with 17 years experience who everybody went to because he knew his stuff and you have to get the airplane up and down using the wheels <laughs> and safely <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Dave, should we put everybody on together now? Not just yet. There's another question from Michael. Suppose you are told by an employer that they are demoting you to a lesser position with a lesser salary. They tell you that if you don't take the lesser position, you will have been, you've been considered to have resigned. Do you resign rather than take the lower position? Can you still collect unemployment? All right. Who who asked that? Michael. There might even be more than one Michael on the call. I don't know. But Michael, you go to the head of the class with that question. That is a technical, not so easy question, but it has a very clear answer. If somebody changes your conditions of employment for the worse. And I'm not talking 10%. I'm talking 25%, 30%, 50%. They cut your days. They cut your hours. They take away the higher value um, work, the thing that makes your job complicated. We all do crappy work in our jobs. I do it every day. But I can do the highest level work. That's what puts me where I am. If they told me, oh, sorry. Council, uh, you're now going to be in charge of the copy machine. They fired me that day. I have been fired. Make no mistake about it. And if they say you will be deemed to have quit, your response in your head is kiss my butt. You just fired me. And okay. you can collect. Um, we'll take one more, then we'll wrap up and keep the discussion open in a few minutes. Uh, this is from Lucius. Are you aware of cities other than New York, I guess that's New York City, that will require salary to be disclosed on a job advertisement? So, you, so this is the employer saying, hey, you have to say what th these people are pitching for. It, that's what this question seems to ask. Yeah. I'm not aware. Uh, Lucius, if you want to clarify, please do. Yeah, can you hear me? Hannah? Yes, yes, we hear you. Yeah, yeah. there's a new law that's coming uh, that was just put in place, I think starting April, maybe you're not aware of it then, where in New York, for all, New York City, all jobs that are, that are being advertised have to disclose what the salary range is for the, for the position. And um, I, I just learned about this. I just wanted to know if you if anyone was aware of other cities that are doing the same thing, because I think that actually is a great benefit for the um, people, you know, seeking jobs within New York City, uh, any potential employees. So the answer to that is, I don't believe New Jersey has done that. Um, I don't know any other cities, but I think we're getting at exactly the same thing as saying, you're not allowed to ask those people. So I'd have to believe, if you're going to say you have to show the range, I don't know whether New York also makes it void to ask people, do they meet that range or are they below that range? But it seems like it's the same uh, kind of a Venn diagram overlap. So, no, I don't. I will look that up. That's a very good. Uh, what is it called? Do you know? 
<clears throat> no, I, I, I just I just know it's supposed to start in April. I don't know the it's a, actual it's about pay equity. Right. Say that again. Statesman. Pay equity. It's a oh, pay, pay equity. equity. Yeah. Got it. All right. Well, you know what? New Jersey does have a pay equity law, <clears throat> which I didn't put on this these slides, which I could have. Um where you it's illegal it's unlawful for you to an employer to offer different pay rates for similar work unless it's differentiated by things like a union contract uh that you've been there for a long time that it requires certain educational skills and all that but if it's really apples to apples they're not allowed because of gender or parenthood or any other thing to dis discriminate so, but that that's a way towards getting to it, uh, I think is a smart thing to do. I'm just curious whether New York also, New York City makes it illegal to ask people um, about um, their their pay history, salary history. Um, so, but so I, I, just, want go, I want to go back to something. I see it in my notes here. This is pretty important. We were talking about bullying there's no pure bullying statute in New Jersey. However, a lot of times people get bullied for a reason. Race, creed, color, national origin, religion, gender, age. If that's the motivation for the bullying, then you have a hostile work environment and you have a cause of action for that. So we have cases where the enforcer is working near you and they just kind of give you the elbow or they push you <clears throat> not because they they perceive that you're a sissy slash gay person but because they're a jerk and you're they're just like the worst rooster on the block that in and of itself is not um considered you know discriminatory unlawfully here's an interesting thing that we have done however Again, remember I said, if a dental patient comes to me and says, do I have a claim? You know, yeah, it costs 10,000 more dollars, but you're not gonna fight for five years over that, go to the dental board. How about this? Somebody shoves you whenever they see you coming by. It's like a return to high school. And you know, Biff the idiot just gives you the, the shoulder every time he goes by. And you tell management and they go, hey, work it out take them to lunch and it's just not working guess who you call this is unbelievable all right seeing no guesses osha occupational safety and health i am getting hurt somebody punched me how about this this really happened in a case so and so said to the other employee i have a gun in my locker and i'm not afraid to use it Management's like, ah, they always say that. Um, hello, OSHA. And there's even a, a, a state version of it called NEOSHA, uh, New Jersey something, Occupational Safety and Health. So if you have issues like that, let me know. There's ways to handle that. You know, we write letters, we make calls, and they're like, oh dear, we didn't know. Yeah, aren't you the one who says, make nice? I've never heard of this before. We will take care of that right away. When I was a young father, my um, second grade kid was getting on the bus and he came home in tears one day. And he's like, the big boys in the back of the bus asked me a math question and called me a baby. Next morning, I go out to the bus and Nancy, the bus driver, opens the door and says, it's never good when the parents show up. Nancy, there's some bullying happening in the back of the bus. She goes, I don't have eyes in the back of my head, but don't you worry, that stops now. And the bus door closed. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe I overreacted. But that's what you need. You need people who are willing to step up and do what needs to be done. And sometimes the employer needs some coaxing. All right. Well, thank you very much, Hannon. Uh, so what we're going to do, let's wrap up the meeting, but we're going to keep the session open. I'm going to turn the recording off in just a moment. But Hannon, thank you so much. Uh, Shelby, thank you so much also for uh, helping with us and um, uh, being the, the brains behind the talent. 
uh, a big help. But this was such a wonderful program. Uh, you know, there's it's a it's a complicated topic. Certainly, employment law. You need someone on your side. And so, if you ever have a question, uh, here's of course Hannon's information, contact information. I also posted it in chat. The chat log will be posted on our website shortly. The slide deck will be posted shortly. You can go take a look. The video will be posted on our YouTube channel shortly. But Hannon, thank you so much for uh, continuing to be such a great supporter of our group, PSU Mercer County. David, um, thank you. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Take care. Great. Thank you so much. And I want to let folks know what's coming up over the next couple of weeks just before we wrap up and then leave the session open. And when I leave the session open, I will turn the recording off. It'll just be us hanging around the meeting room. Uh, so next week, February 4th, uh, Jeff Altman will be here to talk about salary negotiation mistakes. Every once in a while, people like to say, what's the best way to negotiate salary? He's also going to talk about what not to do. I had a nice conversation with Jeff earlier in the week, so this is the opportunity to be a very enlightening presentation. So February 4th, Jeff Altman will be talking about salary negotiating mistakes. The following week is February 11th. Ed Hahn will be here. Ed Hahn is a recruiter. He's been both an in-house in recruiter, a corporate recruiter, as well as an external recruiter. He is now a corporate recruiter. He will be talking about search like a recruiter search like a recruiter so we have that and so that's what's coming up the next couple of weeks also um saturday uh, january 8th at eight in the morning the breakfast club will be meeting the breakfast club of new jersey and it'll be sharon Busey will be talking about enterprise agility current and emerging career opportunities go to the breakfast club's website thebreakfastclubnj.com thebreakfastclubnj.com uh, alex freund is doing a class and a present presentation the landing expert job search mastermind group so you can uh, go to alex's website landingexpert.com landingexpert.com to the event calendar it is five two-hour sessions alternating tuesday and thursdays february 1 3 8 10 and 15 from noon to 2. so go check that out or contact alex um, also psg of central new jersey um, meets uh, every Monday at 10.30, psgcnj.biz, psgcnj.biz, and PSG of Morris County meets every Wednesday at 9.30 in the morning, psgmc.org, psgmc.org. So thanks once again to uh, Hannon and Shelby for participating and leading this program. Thank you everyone for your uh, participation and wonderful questions. I hope you got a lot out of this. And if we don't get to see you in person anytime soon, and I don't know when our meetings will be in person, hopefully we will be seeing you virtually very soon. And until we see each other, I will simply say, bye everybody.